Welcome, Luis, to the Collaborative Research Center Origin and Function of Metaorganisms in Kiel. You just came from the Gulbenkian uh, near Lisbon. Uh, host microbe in interactions are of interest in many places of the world, including your own lab and the Gulbenkian Institute. Um, you were one of the first or among the first who uh, provided and, and who used their fingers to point on an unexpected role of, um, of symbiotic or endosymbiotic um, um, microbes and bacteria. And uh, the paper is now exactly 10 years old, as far as I remember, and, uh, but was a, or is still a classic one. If you look in your Cambridge boss website at that time, he considers this as one of the most influential papers which ever came out from his lab. Maybe you tell us a little bit about uh, what was the story behind that paper, which at that time certainly was um, in early days and not so many people thought in that direction. Yes, well, thanks uh, first for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, so how did I come about that, that story? So the, 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 that paper is about Ovobachia, which is an intracellular bacteria that gives protection against virus. So when I started my postdoc in the lab of Michael Ashburn, uh, I wanted to study antiviral immunity in flies and to understand which, which genes of flies were important for antiviral immunity. So I st started to set up a screen, a classical genetic screen in flies, uh, to look at uh, different mutants and see which were more sensitive and which were less sensitive. And, and in the middle of this setup, uh, there was some confounding factor that was, I could not explain by genetics. There were some flies that were very resistant to the virus, while the others were not. It's the same genetic background. And it was not genetics. Uh, so it took me uh, some time to realize what it was. Uh, it was actually a very uh, depressive moment <laughs> when I realized I was not controlling everything I should control. Uh, and then I realized that, that uh, uh, some months before, I have treated the stocks with antibiotics to get rid of Obakia because I didn't want, want it to be a confounding factor. And now in my preparation, I had some stocks that were pre-treated and some that were not pre-treated. So then so when I realized that it could be Volbachia, and then I, I did the experiments to, to show that in fact it was Volbachia that was giving protection to virus. So I was looking for genes of, of the fly, and I ended up finding that the endosymbiont was giving this very strong protected phenotype. And this was completely unexpected at the time, because many people have been work, had, had been working with, with Volbachia, uh, and, and it was difficult to find strong phenotypes of Wolbachia in Drosophila melanogaster to understand what it was doing there. So such a strong phenotype came as a, as a novelty at that point. Yeah, yeah so very good. And uh, today, I mean, uh, we move from this genetic and genome base to organisms back, uh, so this, and, and then even to meta-organisms as what we do here. And, uh, learning that genetic is not everything which explains the fitness of an organism uh, and that microbes may even be part of an, of an um, uh, innate immune response, uh, which is crucial, uh, was certainly a fantastic and an important observation and is a, a classic today. Um, where does this research head to now? Now, so, so there's, there's two aspects to it. One, one is... Uh, it's an interesting result by itself, uh, such a strong phenotype. How can an endosymbiont uh, have such a protective effect to the host? Uh, it's one of, of some examples that exist. There existed before examples of endosymbionts giving protection to, to pathogens or to parasites. Um, but being so strong, uh, it's a good model to work and understand how these interactions uh, happen and how do they evolve. Uh, but on the other hand, there was, uh, uh, from the beginning, it was very clear that there could be an application for this discovery because uh, uh, there are insects that transmit viral disease to humans, mostly uh, mosquitoes, and if Wolbachia could give protection to the mosquito also, it would prevent mosquito infection with this virus, and then the mosquito is not able to transmit the disease to, to humans. 
Uh, so at that time, uh, by by chance, there was uh, uh, there were other groups that were uh, moving Volbakia that had moved Volbakia to Mosquito, uh, and 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 so they could they could immediately check if if this phenotype also existed in in mosquitoes, uh, and it did. So in uh, Aedes aegypti, which is the main vector for uh, dengue, chikungunya, and now it's known Zika virus too. The the mosquito is protected from infection with this virus uh, by by Volbachia, and and so there's a, nowadays a big consortium uh, uh, funded by the Gates Foundation and led by Scott O'Neill in in Australia, uh, where they are releasing mosquitoes with Volbachia in different places of the world, uh, where these diseases are endemic, uh, in an effort to see if it can block uh, this virus transmission. So from the basic research, uh, it went very fast to the applied research. Mm -hmm. That's um, actually a very good example of um, uh, how important basic research really is, um, particularly here in, this, in a kind of a biomedical environment uh, here where we have a, a strong clinic uh, research going on. There's always the obvious question, well, who cares about flies or worms or hydra, I mean, all what is of importance is humans. And uh, one cannot stress uh, enough the importance of model systems um, to find out basic rules. And uh, um, would you agree to that? Well, uh, uh, yes, of course, absolutely agree with that, since uh, uh, yeah, I work with Rodolfo Lomano Gaster for many years as a, as a model system. And, and, uh, and it has been proven over and over again, that, that, that basic research is fundamental to understand uh, principles, to, to identify molecules, to, to, to know uh, the, the basic, uh, uh, not to have the basic knowledge about processes. And that then this can move to, to applied research. And that what is also interesting and very important to, to stress is that uh, it's not clear from the beginning which basic research will lead to which applied research. Most of the times, uh, it's, it's basic research has fundamental questions without knowing how they're going to apply, for, apply it afterwards. And then many years later, there's applications for this. There's another aspect to this, which is that basic research is valuable by itself also, even if it's not applicable, or even it won't be applied to human health. Uh, just as a cultural and uh, human enterprise, uh, I think basic research and understanding fundamental principles of the natural history of, of, the, of nature is, is important. Yeah, I, I appreciate that very much. And I, I also appreciate um, in my um, perception the German situation at the moment where we have really a, a quite decent support for basic research. and. We do not have to justify in the any entrance sentence um, why we are doing this research on unimportant model systems. Uh, we are not going to treat diseases. We just want to understand fundamental processes of life, which then may or may not lead to uh, um, to some applications. As in your case, it's now wonderfully did. Uh, to my mind, the trouble is sometimes when people working with model animals um, make the connection to a particular human disease very tight and then call it D&D &D disease now in Drosophila or in worm or in mouse and uh, that is then misleading and also disappointing the medical community because of course this is just an animal where this disease phenotype may be a bit different but it's certainly good and maybe the only way to understand fundamental concepts behind and conserve the essential mechanisms behind. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But I, I think I think we see a lot of that. That that uh, I have to do the same when I apply to to grant money. I have to somehow justify it. Uh, how could that be applied in many grants? Now that's a requirement. Uh, Germany is an exception to that. So I think, I think more and more scientists that do basic research are forced to write those texts. So many times they will be forced. And when you read it, know, it's obvious that it's forced. I still find it very awkward. Yeah, and, really and, and, and then the, I think the problem is, is then it becomes a habit. 
and and then maybe it becomes in uh, in training you that you should do that and and that that's problematic yeah but so, uh, but i think it's a funding agencies that that should change first right but you also have to say again and again as you said in the beginning i mean basic research has its value per se and Sidney Brenner discovered apoptosis because he was interested in how does a simple worm contain, maintain 956 somatic cells. And then he got a Nobel Prize. And afterward, now ap anti-apoptotic drugs is one of the major routes in cancer therapy. Yeah, yeah I think, I think that it, we'll see lots of examples like that. He, he was uh, not interested in that. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, let me go back to your, your, I mean, you're relatively young in the field, but very, very successful, very visible. And uh, going back to your early training, I mean, you are, uh, you got your training at the Gulbenkian Institute, your PhD training at the Gulbenkian Institute in Portugal, near Lisbon. But at the same time, also, you were somehow several years in Heidelberg at the AMBL and um, in a former conversations you told me that how how lucky and how happy you are when you think back on your early training career can, can you tell us a little bit what were essential points which allowed you to develop in a in the manner which you did now okay so first i was uh, very lucky that actually i did the pg program of the uh, gubenkian institute of science and the pg program of embl and that was because first i entered the 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 Gubenkian PG program, which uh, was very innovative at the time, uh, where uh, students would, would enter the PG program and they would have nine months to 12 months of lectures. And then afterwards they could choose uh, where they wanted to go, which lab they wanted to go in the world. They had a fellowship and they could just choose. Uh, and I chose uh, the MBL, and that's why I ended up at the MBL PG program. So this, this uh, Gulbenkian PG program uh, at, at this structure, and, and it's a simple structure, but very, um, uh, uh, the outcome is very, is very positive, which is the, the, there were topics, one week or two weeks maximum per topic, let's say immunology or uh, apoptosis or uh, cell uh, cytoskeleton. There were many topics along the, along the year. And, and to each week, we had two or three external uh, teachers that, that would be leading figures in the field that would come from all over the world again. They would come in, they would be one week just with us. We're Privilege because we were 16 students, PG students, for one week with those excellent person, uh, excellent uh, teachers, and week after week we had this, and and that gave us a great perspective of what was being done, what was excellent science. We will discuss papers and we'll be there uh, many hours uh, with this with this faculty, and and this this was really an excellent PG program. So, in essence, if you summarize um, and if I ask you what is the lesson learned from that type of training, um, if I get a few points, this is certainly the direct confrontation with leading persons in the field and uh, lots of freedom and also the possibility to choose a place where you want to practically exercise some of the questions which you find interesting. Yeah, exactly, that's, that's, a, that's a very good summary. And the, the confrontation part is a good summary because we were not being lectured. We, we had presentations, I mean it was a teaching activity, but we were free to ask anything and to challenge and if we didn't understand the basic concept we could just discuss it for a long time. And that's, that's, that's a unique opportunity. Uh, now, that brings me, of course, to uh, your additional challenges and successes which you do. You are one of the very visible conveners of a very visible summer school now in your institution as a, a, senior, as a senior researcher. And I have the feeling when I now hear about your own uh, training and bringing up, you try to to establish and to realize many of these key steps of, of your own training into that summer school. Is that uh, what you have in mind when you now? Yes, that that plus the that I, I also been actively teaching in the in the PG program of the Gulbenkian Institute of Science, 
since I, I, I came back to it, that I started the group there. So these, this tradition, uh, this structure has been kept to a certain extent uh, and also um, more, and we also, uh, we've tried in the, in the courses that I organize and be involved and in other courses other, other people try that also to, to increase the, the challenge to the students and try to make them uh, discuss better uh, projects or questions that are important in the field. So it's true when we, we started to think about the summer school, uh, we, we incorporated many, many of these concepts and basically the summer school is an intense two weeks where again we try to bring the, the best uh, researchers in the field that are at the front, fr forefront of the field that come in and tell us or tell the students and discuss with the students where the field is now, uh, where they discuss their own research and um, an important uh, aspect for this, this summer school has been to, to, to have the students develop a project in itself, um, a conceptual project uh, of a question that is important, and to keep discussing that for the two weeks with the, with the faculty. And I think that's, that's, that's the best way of incorporating knowledge, is to understand where's, where's the frontier, that first you have to realize that, to know where is the frontier, we have to know what is known, uh, and then to think about what to do next, what's, what's the future. And this with PhD students is interesting because they, they actually are going to be the, the future, so it's, it's, it's important to do that with yeah, them. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, if I think as a senior researcher in the field, I mean, it's still for us, it's very challenging these times of where is the field? Yes. <laughs> where is the field going? Um, many paradigms are just uh, collapsing or changing and shifting very quickly. Um, we realize that Margaret McFall or we say silos are collapsing and previously, so now um, territories or subjects or fields or departments um, are not helpful anymore in, ter in terms of con concept. If you want to understand such an enormous challenging area like how does a complex organism interact with many hundreds and thousands of other organisms. And uh, um, I can imagine how much more challenging that must be for a PhD student who comes from a certain subject and now comes to your summer school and uh, all of a sudden sees, oh my God, um, this is really complex issues. How you deal with that interdisciplinary challenge? Well, um, one aspect is, is to, to bring different people to teach the students so that they can have the different perspectives uh, on how to do it. Um, the other one is that may, maybe it's easier for the PG student to actually integrate and see the new, the new way of integrating the knowledge than, than for, for people that are doing it for a long time and they already have settled on a vision of the world or a vision of their model organism. Mm -hmm. So hopefully the students, by, by again, by being exposed to, to many different views, and actually that's part of the effort on organizing the, the summer school is that there are different views because there are arguments in the field and it's not clear where it's going, so it's important to have people with different opinions of where it's going uh, so that the students see this and they can uh, make up their m own minds and, and see what's, what's interesting now. Mm -hmm. And return back to their places and maybe, uh, maybe spread the word yes. about, yeah. Um, thinking back to your classical paper 2008 and seeing now the present, um, where do you think the field will be in five and or ten years. I mean, the symbiosis community was a very active but a very small community of scholars around the world which studied seemingly an eclectic problem, uh, which is maybe true for some exotic animals and uh, like corals or something. And uh, now we realize that there is no life without symbiotic interactions actually going. So where do you, th where do you see the field in maybe five years and, in a, in, and then in a longer perspective? So what I see happening now, and I think then the future will be a continuation of this, is that we, we're still in a stage that there is uh, many correlations being described. And I, I think it's because uh, the microbiota seems to impact so many aspects of, of, of biology that whoever is doing a certain aspect of biology ends up 
finding the microbiota is an important factor or as a factor that correlates with what they're studying. So in the last years, there, there's been a lot of correlation. But I think it, it's, it's visible now that, that we're moving away from correlation uh, to, to causality. And, and I think that the next step that's also already ongoing is from causality to understand the mechanisms and to understand what are the molecules regulating these, how the interaction is happening. And then on top of that, uh, uh, the future will be to understand these in the complex community, as a community, uh, because most of what is still being done is is host microbe interaction, where you look at one microbe or you look at two microbes, and uh, and we'll have to be able to look at the at the full community and to understand the, the role of the microbes uh, in the community and the interaction as a community interaction. Yeah, very very interesting. A, a colleague here in the center call it the concept of nested ecosystems. So you start with an organism which is an ecosystem, but this is part of another ecosystem, and this is part of another ecosystem. Yeah, I, I, think, I think also that's, that's a, uh, another, another uh, layer that is becoming clear and I think will be stronger in the future is that uh, we, we'll, we'll have to understand the problem from an ecology point of view. Uh, so we'll have to bring ecology that has been dealing with, with completely different aspects or at a different level than, 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 than uh, uh, molecular biologists or microbiologists, many microbiologists have, have been looking at, and, and we have to combine these, these fields. Because at the end, this is, this is a problem of interaction, this is an ecology problem at the end. So that's what has to be understood. This seemingly also has vast applications and industrial, you know, is of industrial interest and uh, I mean, the, the classic uh, probiotic companies, these are old fashioned and probably uh, from the, the medieval ages, meanwhile, um, is a new concept. Do you see, maybe in Portugal or worldwide, that the basic research is directly feeding into applications, is feeding into maybe into changes in industrial research and also maybe then ending up already in some products which are generally available? Or is that something which is um, not, uh, not, not yet, not yet, uh, not yet a reality? I think eventually it will transfer. I see, I see uh, from ads and from what is being announced that there are many companies are, are trying to sell the, the microbiota field or microbiome field as an application. But I, I, I think at this point they're probably not serious companies that that are doing that, and that will take a while until we we get the transfer of knowledge from basic research on microbiota to, to apply it. The, the only, I think the best, the best example where this has worked is, is on uh, uh, Clostridium difficile uh, uh, chronic infections, where it's very clear that microbiota manipulation is an imp important therapy. Mm -hmm. But I think the rest still has to, to develop more. Mm -hmm. And even there, we do not really understand uh, so the, basic, the basic science behind yet. No, we're starting to understand now the yeah. mechanisms. Uh, right. But, but at least it works, yeah. and it's clear that it yeah. works. So it's still time of uh, exciting basic research and, uh, and uh, groundbreaking discoveries of, of mechanisms uh, and applications will come yes, then later. Yes, I think yeah. so. Thank you very much for coming. Well, thank, thank you. you very much for having me.